Hello there. We're glad that you could join us for our fourth Sunday of Advent worship service. And we have uh, Charlie Marshall uh, joining us with music. And Sue McIntosh is our lecturer today. And we're glad they're both with us today. And we're glad that you could be with us today. Uh, my name is Richard McSherry. I'm the pastor of the Shaftesbury Methodist Church. And we're filming here at the First Baptist Church on Main Street. And we're glad that you could be with us today as we continue our journey to Bethlehem. For that's what we're doing during this time of Advent. Um, as we do so, let us uh, go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Gracious God, we thank you for this season of the year, the season of joy and hope and expectation. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us as we worship and praise and encourage one another. For we ask this in the name of the babe of Bethlehem, even Jesus our Savior. Amen. We come to the lighting of our fourth and final uh, uh, Advent uh, candle today. And I want to share with you a scripture from the Gospel of Luke. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with a heavenly host an angel of the Lord praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Today, we relight the candles of expectation and hope, recalling God's promises, the candle of preparation, remembering the voice crying in the wilderness, urging the people to prepare the way of the coming Lord and the candle of proclamation, reminding us of the joy found in him. Oops. Now, we light the candle of revelation and peace. We celebrate the announcement of the coming King and the greatness of God's love revealed through the Christ child. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And we praise you for the greatness of your love toward us. Help us to share your peace, your love, and your joy with those around us. And may our lives, more and more every day, reflect the life of Jesus, our Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll have our gathering song.
This time we'll join together in the reading of our Christmas Creed, um, which we have here today. I believe in Jesus Christ and in the beauty of the gospel begun in Bethlehem. I believe in the one whose spirit glorified a little town and whose spirit still brings music to persons all over the world in towns both large and small. I believe in the one for whom the crowded inn could find no room, and I confess that my heart still sometimes wants to exclude Christ from my life today. I believe in the one whom the rulers of the earth ignored and the proud could never understand, whose life was among common people, whose welcome came from persons of hungry hearts. I believe in the one who proclaimed the love of God to be invincible. I believe in the one whose cradle was a mother's arms, whose modest home in Nazareth had love for its only wealth, who looked at persons and made them see what God's love saw in them, who by love brought sinners back to purity and lifted human weakness up to meet the strength of God. I confess my everlasting need of God, the need of forgiveness for our selfishness and greed, the need of new life for empty souls, the need of love for hearts grown cold. I believe in God who gives us the best of himself. I believe in Jesus, the Son of the living God, born in Bethlehem this night for me and for all the world. At this time we'll have our first hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory. And as we come to worship with the angels and the whole company of heaven, we want to come to the Lord at this time to bring our praises and our concerns and our caring. We are so thankful for this time of year. And our great praise is that God gave us the greatest gift he had when he gave us his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we certainly want to return thanks and praise for that. We also want to bring up those things which concern us, uh, those matters which need prayer and attention and again if you have uh, a prayer request please feel free to call us at 802-442-4599 and we'll be happy to put you on our prayer list you can talk to us about prayer at that time so please feel free to do so we look forward to hearing from you let's turn to God in prayer at this time gracious God we are indeed thankful for your love and your mercy and your kindness to us each and every day. We're thankful for the greatest gift we've ever received, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for those momentous events at Bethlehem. We thank you for shepherds and kings, for innkeepers, and even for cattle in the stall, which witnessed that great event. We thank you for that little town, which is now known around the world because of that great birth. Gracious God, give us grateful hearts. Lord, we know that during this season of Christmas, there are many that, because of social isolation and perhaps other issues, are far from family, far from loved ones. They're not able to gather as, as they usually do. They're not able to enjoy the traditions and the customs that they've grown up with and learned to love. 
And we pray for those. We pray for the least and the lonely. We pray that you will comfort them in their isolation, Lord. We pray for those who are in hospitals and nursing homes and healthcare facilities of many kinds. Be with them during this time, Lord. Be with those who are sick, whether in mind or body or spirit. Lord, just be with them in a healing way, we pray. And gracious God, be with our churches and especially all the churches of our community, Lord, as we stop to celebrate and rejoice in the birth of our Savior. Lord, be with our tired, broken, and hurting world and our nation. Be with the men and women of our armed forces who are far from home and overseas during this time. And be with each and every one of us individually, Lord, that we will reflect the love that you came to show, which was shown in Jesus, as even as we pray his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, um, as I've mentioned, these past few weeks we've been sharing Christmas customs from different cult cultures and different countries, and we just see that there's such a rich expression around the globe of various ways of honoring the birth of our Savior. One of the simplest and most poignant comes from Ireland. In Ireland, and it's reflected here as well, people put candles in their windows. And those candles are placed there to tell Mary and Joseph on their journey to Bethlehem that even though they may not find rest in any inn in the land, there and there, Irish home, no matter how humble, no matter how modest, there's always room for the Holy Family and the infant Christ child. It's a beautiful tradition. Even today, if you go to Ireland and you see the President's house in Dublin, in one window, there's always a candle lit in that window, a sign of welcome to any who may pass by. And so as we think about that, let's keep a candle lit in our hearts to welcome Jesus there. Amen? Thank you. At this time we'll have our second hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Christmas is a time of, of reaching out, of reaching out to those who maybe we haven't spoken to in a long time, people we've, we've um, maybe forgotten about, sadly, and we want them to remember, and we want them to know that we remember them. 
Christmas is a time of, of card sending and gift giving and of joy. Sadly, so many of those things and the challenges that we're going through right now are, are being set on a shelf perhaps, but uh, we still want to give. We want to give of our hearts and our lives, our time, as it's been said, our talent and our treasure. God gave his very best in giving us Jesus. May you prayerfully consider what you, in turn, can give to him as an offering and a gift. This time we'll have our scripture reading and we'll begin with our Psalter reading, which today is going to be Psalm 126, if you'd like to look that up in your Bibles and follow along or even recite it aloud. Um, it's Psalm 126 and uh, Sue and I will be reading that responsibly at this time. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves with them. And the reading from the Old Testament is from Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, or as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian's defeat. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
And the reading from the New Testament is from the letter of Paul to Titus, from chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all and training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age, to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly while we wait for the blessed hope, the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is he who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. And the Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world shall be registered. This was the first registration taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth among peace among those whom he favors. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts gathered wherever we may be at this moment be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today our long Advent journey is almost over. We're within a hair's breadth of that day for which we have been waiting these past four weeks. Our fourth and final Advent candle, as we can see, has been lit. And here we are. The grace of God has appeared, no matter what the outward circumstances of our lives may be like at this present time. How we need to hear this message of hope and peace and joy, especially today. Someone reminds us that the gloom of the world is but a shadow. Behind it and within our reach is joy. There's radiance and glory in darkness. Could we but see? And to see, we have only to look. Life is so generous a giver, but we, judging the gifts by their covering, cast them away as ugly or heavy or unwanted. Remove the covering and you will find beneath it a living splendor woven of love by wisdom with power. Welcome it, grasp it, and you will touch the angel's hand that brings it to you. And this is the critically important part of this statement. Everything that we call, everything that we call a trial, a sorrow, or a duty, 
Believe me, the angel's hand is there. The gift is there, and the wonder of that overshadowing presence is there as well. The gloom is but a shadow. Behind it and within our reach is joy. That's the message of Christmas. The gloom of this world, the darkness, the defeats, the disappointments of our present age do not have the final say. No, indeed. The American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was one of the greatest writers in American history. And one of his poems has become a standard Christmas carol of the season. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. And this poem, Carol, tells of his despair upon hearing the peal of Christmas bells during the midst of the American Civil War. Two years prior to his writing of this poem, Longfellow lost his wife in a tragic accident. Then in 1862, during the war, the Civil War, Longfellow's oldest son enlisted in the Union Army without his father's blessing. Unheard of in that day. He was severely wounded during that conflict and had a very long convalescence. Coupled with his personal tragedies and the tragedy of war, Longfellow was in deep despair. And this is reflected in I Heard the Bells. This note of despair is not hidden. It's not whitewashed but clearly expressed in this poem. But the thing is, it doesn't end here. It doesn't end in despair. It crescendos to a triumph of hope and peace and joy. I'll share some of the words with you now. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then reflecting on, on his own personal difficulties and, and, and a world at war, he writes, and in despair I hung my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth. Goodwill to men. We can understand these words in the context of their place and time. But on further reflection, Longfellow realizes that there is indeed, in spite of all of that, reason to hope and trust and rejoice. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, and the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. We, along with Longfellow, also have reason to hope and rejoice as well. Because, as Titus puts it, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all. You see, when that grace in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to Mary and to Joseph and to Elizabeth, shepherds and innkeepers, and later on in the story, of course, the wise men, that grace appeared to all of us. The Bible clearly tells us in Acts, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is acceptable accepted by God. In other words, the grace of God is able, is available to all, no matter who they are or where they come from. One paraphrase of this uh, verse expresses it as follows. Peter exploded with the good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God has no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as God says, that door is open to you. The message he sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ everything is put together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere among everyone. The world of the shepherds wasn't a highly regarded one in that day. It was difficult, backbreaking work. They were out in all sorts of weather. They were considered by what might be called respectable society to be a rough and tumble lot. 
We see the shepherds in our imaginations with fluffy white sheep, sheep gathered all around and see a very sanitized version of that first century world of shepherding. Shepherds did not have a good reputation among neighbors, <clears throat> but it was to them, to these people, that the Lord brought the good news. The angel who brought tidings of great joy did not stop and go to Herod's magnificent palace or the court of the Roman governor. The angel didn't go to the religious leadership of the day. Indeed, the angel went to one of the least notable people of the first century world. And it was to them, to these shepherds, that the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The thing is, God always seems to do the unpredictable, doesn't he? God reached out to Abraham and created a nation. He took tongue-tied Moses and led God's people to a new and promised land. God had other young shepherds, David by name, defeat Goliath and give hope to a downtrodden people. God, through the centuries, raised up prophets and preachers and kings just when his people needed it the most. And now God appears in a stable, a barn, the dwelling pl place of cattle. And in a manger we see the very hope of eternity before us. There's where hope is lying on a bed of straw. But to approach, you have to let go of a lot of things. Oh, not necessarily material goods, but prejudices, preconceptions, and attitudes that prevent us from embracing the miracle. It's much like going to present-day Bethlehem. In the center of that little town, still quite little, there's an ancient church, the oldest church in Christendom, the Church of the Nativity. The thing is, it has a very low door. And in order to enter that church, you have to stoop to get in. You have to let go of things to get in. And that's a great metaphor for our coming into the presence of God. Just as Mary said yes to God, and just as the shepherds <clears throat> obeyed the voice of the angel, so too we have to see the Savior, a Savior wrapped in rags and lying in a manger. And we have to embrace that Savior as well, invite that Savior into our heart and lives. John 1, 12 to 13 tells us, But to as many as received him, to them he gave right to become the children of God, to those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. This Christmas may very well be one of the most challenging most of us have ever experienced. Many of our cherished customs and traditions may be shelved for this year, but nevertheless, God's grace and mercy and love stands firm. We do not have to give in to despair. No, indeed. You see, God has visited our world, and we have a new and a living hope in him. This Christmas arrival was a rescue mission. Jesus came to rescue us from the very worst part of us. In what is perhaps the best-known verse in all of Scripture, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever... Now there's a broad category, isn't it? Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God, verse 17 tells us, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through Jesus, would be saved. And that rescue mission begins with each and every one of us. And all that that requires is saying yes to the one who reaches out. Someone once asked, who can add to Chris Christmas? The perfect motive is that God so loved the world. The perfect gift is that he gave his only begotten son. And the only requirement is to believe, place one's trust, faith, and confidence in him. And the reward of faith is that you will have everlasting life. And you know, there's nothing, absolutely nothing you can do to buy or earn that precious gift of this everlasting life. It's a gift of God. In the book of Romans of the New Testament, we read, But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, 
the righteousness of God through faith in Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we are justified, in other words, made right, we're made right by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We can't bribe God, we can only say yes. And you know, we're all in the same boat after all. As it says here, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, no matter who we are, miss the mark. We all mess up from time to time. But that is why we have Christmas. God reached out to us with his very best when we were at our very worst. And out of his vast mercy, God offers us his love in the person of his only begotten son. That free gift. Now that's something that we have to grasp especially this time of year. Every gift we get this Christmas will fade and get broken and wear out eventually. But that gift never fades. And with all the merrymaking and the gift giving, we should understand the nature of that unimaginable gift. You know, if a friend came to your door and wished you the heartiest greetings of the season and handed you a beautifully wrapped gift with bows and ribbons and everything and said, there you go, that'll be $49.95. Well, you would be taken aback, I can well imagine. And as well you should. You see, if you were having to remit payment in the amount of $49.95 or whatever amount of payment, that item would, by its very nature, cease to be a gift. It would no longer be a gift. God's love, God's grace, God's gift is free as any gift is. We need only come with open and empty hands before him. As Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace have we been saved through faith. And this is not your doing. It is the gift of God. The gift of God is freely offered and freely given. In our challenging time, we need that message of hope. We need to know that we may be going through this terrible thing at the moment, but it's not the end. It's not the period at the end of the sentence. It's not the final chapter of the book. It's not the last curtain call. No, indeed. Because of the Lord's presence in our lives, we have a living and vital hope. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, and then just when everything is bearing down on us to such an extent that we can scarcely withstand it, the Christmas message comes to tell us that all our ideas are wrong and that what we have to do is to stand and that light will come from God. Our eyes are at fault, that's all. God is in the manger. Wealth in poverty, light in darkness. No evil can befall us, whatever others may do to us. They cannot but serve the God who is secretly revealed as love and rules the world and our lives. Fear not, the angel said, fear not. And we need not fear. The Bible tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. And in that manger, we witness the incarnation of God's perfect love. As has been said, Christianity was born in one big heavenly interruption. Just ask the shepherds. They had no expectations of excitement. They were, sh they were sheep and they were watching their sheep. We count sheep to go to sleep. Shepherds, however, trust, treasured the predictable. This was the night shift, after all. Remember, they were gathered at night. And any excitement was usually bad excitement. Wolves, lions, poachers, just because they wanted a calm night didn't mean they were going to get it. Luke says, And the angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. We can always assume the worst before we look for the best. Good thing the shepherds lingered, isn't it? Good thing they stayed. Otherwise, they might have missed that second verse. Today, unto you is born a Savior who will be Christ the Lord. I hope you'll do what the shepherds did this Christmas. Linger by the manger. Linger by the Savior. Soak in that moment. Glory to God in the highest and peace. And peace to all of us. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the message of hope and light that we have at the manger. Help us, Lord, to 
to just pause and reflect prayerfully on all that you've done for us. Amen. At this time we'll have our final hymn, which is the first Noel, the angels did say. Glad you could join with us today um, for this fourth and final Sunday of Advent, and we look forward to um, being with you again for our Christmas Eve service. Let, now let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, bless us and keep us in your watch care, in our going out and our coming in and our rising up and our lying down and our laughter, and yes, Lord, even in our tears until that great and glorious day which will have no dawning and no sunset. And now may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.